Um, hello, everybody. Oop. Hello, everybody. Um, I can't see any of you, and that's dead infuriating. And I'm going to start off by saying, um, for me, this is really an in, kind of an, intro, an introduction. I'm trying to get the light from my glasses. Any better? No. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm looking forward to in a way to kind of find out about uh, what you guys are up to and and how I can help or I can slot in. Um, so today is going to be sort of whistle stop tour of a few things that I can remember. Um, because I'm a bit of a, a jack of all trades, really. Um, I'm going to start off with this picture. And that's a picture of Joseph Morris Stubbs, who was my dad. And um, it's on the cover of a festival. I've started and run a few festivals over the years. This was Root in Hull in 98. But the reason I start with this picture is because that's my dad working on the first electron microscope in Britain um, in the very early 1960s, either at British Rubber or Unilever, not sure which. Um, so I had a scientist as a father. I was crap at school and like cars and motorbikes and mucked about a lot. And basically I kind of lived under the um, auspices that if you could prove something, it wasn't empirically evidenceable. It didn't exist. Um, and with a dad like that, it meant that I very quickly um, turned to art and mucking about even more. Um, however, through my life, uh, as, as I actually got over being rubbish at school and, and got to art school, and I've been very lucky to have a kind of privileged and, um, you know, great, a sort of great life doing art projects and research um, that I have, of course, touched increasingly on elements which think about science, even though I've never claimed to be a scientist. Um, Today I'm going to speak as an artist, which is kind of what I always do. So that in, in terms of research practice, it's, um, you know, it's what I do. It's that I've, I've had a, a lucky life as an artist, curator, arts advocate, and the director of some institutions. And just briefly, I'm going to show you a few pictures of some of the projects that I've done in the past. Um, and where I've worked in sort of more recent years. Um, so I'm going to start off, I'm going to share a screen. Will someone shout at me if it doesn't work, please? So I'm going to start off with this one. Is that going? That's going. Cool. So um, about 18 years ago, I moved from Scotland, where I was a senior research fellow at Dundee University, um, to Melbourne, Australia. And I was the head of program for the Australian Centre for Moving Image in Federation Square in a building which was just a year old, um, an extraordinary site, um, an indigenous person's dreaming ground with this sort of incredible complex on Fed Square built. Um, and it meant that, that, that apart from being a brilliant museum and gallery and cinema, um, that it really interfaced with broad broad populations, including people that were kind of watching sports um, or people taking a stroll down the river when you kind of look at where this complex is within central Melbourne. It is, of course, did form part of a regeneration strategy for Melbourne, which in the 1980s, which was as kind of dishevelled as Hull, Dundee, Liverpool and Doncaster, all cities that I've lived and worked in, and all happen to have estuaries or industrial pasts where for one reason or another, they've had their industrial heart removed. So then I go to Liverpool about four years later, moved back to England, actually to look after my dad, um, who's no longer with me. And I became the chief exec of FACT, Foundation for Arts and Creative Technology in Liverpool, which was a kind of an extraordinary period of my life this was in the lead up to the European Capital of Culture, um, and I'm very lucky to help deliver that along with the Liverpool Biennale. Um, and I was very fortunate that we had access to European funding, 
um, MPO funding through the Arts Council, great support through the Regional Development Agency, etc., so on and so on. Um, and we had enormous kind of international tentacles and partnerships, along with superb projects, um, which were deeply ingrained uh, with a kind of deep engagement focus. There are too many to even touch on. That might be a subject for another talk, but a, a couple that I've just pulled out because I could remember them, um, you know, amongst hundreds. But um, this one is a piece of work uh, by the artist Zistov Dishko. Um, and Zistov Dishko uh, is a Polish artist who was a basically emigre from Warsaw and Poland um, during the Holocaust um, as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as a Polish Jew who moved to New York to, to escape the death camp. And it subsequently has spent a lifetime working with refugees, homeless people, migrants, um, and went through a good 10, 15 year period of working for returning soldiers. So I, I did two projects with him, one for Liverpool Biennale and one with the Abandoned Normal Devices Festival, which today I'm promoting, which I was also one of the co-founders of. Um, and the, the reason I love this project so much is that it started out as this sort of extraordinary intervention into public space, asking questions about perceptions around being a soldier, PSD, the deep impact of uh, what war really means through an artist's work. But in the process of making the project, Zistoff really wanted to interact and collaborate over a period of time with returned soldiers. So we collaborated with Combat Stress, um, a local agency designed for um, re kind of reintegrating returned soldiers into civilian life. And that ended up uh, leading into a nine year project called Vets in Practice as a kind of byproduct of working with the artist on this one off show. And that then became a, a sort of nine year process of, in a sense, skills development, acclimatization, healthcare. Um, a lot of conversation about mental health, which was both challenging for fact as an organization, but monstrously stimulating. And as one of my sort of kind of core principles in most things I do, I'm very, very interested in bringing um, art into unusual places, into the urban realm, the public realm, um, and talking not to the usual subjects and actually inter interacting with people of all different um, diverse backgrounds. And for me, that also includes uh, class. Uh, I, I think of myself as being very fortunate to escape a working class background. Um, and that's what my dad wanted. And I managed to go to college, um, whereas he didn't. He was from a, a family of shipbuilders and in, in vicars in Baron Furness. Um, so in, in, in a sense, it's really important for me to want to speak to people of all backgrounds. Um, the next project from fact that I could just kind of put on the screen and I'm not going to go into this one, but be another lab links to this notion about trauma. And it also thinks about embodiment and disability and emotional and um, non-visible disability um, and it was one of the great projects we did these these guys are from Spain um, which looked into notions of virtuality embodiment um, and it's a project which made Nick Sorota the chair of the Arts Council cry and everyone who took part in this experiment had a it had a very profound impact on them um, and just thinking about some of the people that may be in the audience for today's talk, I thought that was a reasonable example. Um, now I'm gonna to go to something quite different. Before I speak about this project, um, I just thought I'd say a little, a little bit about um, what it means to be someone who thinks like an artist, who's been very fortunate to um, lead major institution um, 
and has kind of, in a way, got away with experimenting and being disruptive through a lifetime. Um, and um, at times when I've worked for ACME, which was a government organization or FACT, which had, you know, strong links to local authority, the Arts Council and government, um, at that level, it's impossible really to work as an artist. Um, too much conflict of interest, it's too difficult. And you're so deeply committed to doing those jobs that how could you possibly have the brain space to even pretend to be an artist? Um, three years ago, I moved to Doncaster because I wanted to be part-time. And um, so I said, kind of offered a part-time freelance contract to head up Doncaster Creates. And that, that coincided with me bringing to fruition two major art projects I've been working on for four or five years. Um, and the first one is this one. Now, this, this article is literally published about 15 minutes ago by Robert Frenet, who's an art and science critic. And he's basically written a, uh, a review or an article about this project, Escaping Gravity, Airship Dreams. That I've been working on in Bedford, Bedford being my hometown. And um, as, as you can see in this picture, if you can see where my cursor is over the, the shed, that shed is 720 feet long. It was the biggest building when it was built in 1926. Um, and it housed the R101 airship, which you see attached to this mooring mast. Um, which was the, the heart of the Imperial Airship program in Britain. Um, after the First World War, Britain basically kind of copied Germany and tried to introduce the Zeppelin program for a number of different uh, motivations, world domination and imperialism, surveillance, luxury travel, um, and under the auspices of the Royal Navy, hence it's a shed, uh, not a hangar, um, they built the R, the R, well, the R38, the R32, the R100, and the R101. And unfortunately, the R101 ended up in a, in a tragedy, a little bit like the Titanic. And it's an extraordinary story that I won't go into. Um, but there's this article, um, Airlander, this is Airlander 10, which was built actually inside that shed. Um, and, and I was kind of looking at a sort of combination of contemporary uh, meaning around lighter than air travel, the history of the Imperial Airship Program, whilst also making a um, uh, immersive new media installation, which I'm gonna give you a little walk around in a moment. Um, so you see a few pictures here, and then we're just gonna go, okay, I'm gonna go to, this is Den's shed. So this is part of a museum exhibition, which is part of the same exhibition. Um, missed that one out. So, and I've just done this little book as well, which is a catalogue for the show, which is on until November, the end of November in Bedford. But now we're just gonna have a little virtual look around. Because of the pandemic, we built this, if it'll load and play. Um, I'm gonna go full screen and hopefully this will work. Can you nod, Claire? Good, okay, so we're now in the foyer of the Higgins Museum, and this is a two-part exhibition. Um, we go into here, and you can, first of all, you can see Dan's shed. So Dan was someone I collaborated with, who was the shed manager in Bedford at Cardington for, uh, for more than 40 years. He was involved in training parachutists. He was Britain's um, dirigible expert. He did all sorts of things with helium balloons um, and he knew the four survivors of the R101 crash when it crashed into a cliff in France on its way to Karachi. Um, before, he's re only recently died, but before he died, very fortunate to actually visit this shed and film him in his shed. If I can get inside it, you'll see that we've reconstructed it with all of the paraphernalia that put in it. And there's also a video inside, which you can see him talking um, on this. Whoop, I've come back out too far. So there's a video in there of Dan talking um, and I'll share the link and you can have a proper look around. But working with the um, museum curator, Lydia Saul, we did a museum exhibition of 
a whole range of artifacts and ephemera that people donated for this exhibition from the uh, enthusiasts and people who knew the history, including Derek Binks, who was the son of um, one of the survivors. So a sort of community cur curated exhibition around the Airship Programme and its relationship to Bedford. This is Hilda Lyons, who was a um, engineer and inventor who invented the, 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 the dynamics of the nose cone, which would influence both aeronautical and uh, nautical design in the future. We did a project with students from a local college. Um, we did kids workshops, all as part of the, the show. Um, and if I go out here, let, let me, if I got stuck, if you go through here, and there's a picture of me up here somewhere. This is me with, with Dan in his shed before he died. Um, and we shot some 360, which you can also see of inside the shed. Um, lots of, you know, a lot of work, big project, massive collaboration. Um, and then through here, is the second part of the exhibition, which we'll also have a quick look at. And I would, you know, this, for me, this does not suffice as, as of the, of the exhib exhibition experience. This is quite a elaborate uh, new media installation with sculptural elements. Um, it's a 30 minute video work. Um, and then you can see these sculptural elements where Basically, there's a map of the world or the Imperial Airship program um, cut out of carpet. Um, and one of the stories that goes along with the R101 is that one of the reasons it's crashed is that Lord Thompson, who was the, um, the person in charge, was basically full of hubris and wanted um, to take more gifts to the Maharaja. And he also lengthened the um, lengthen the airship um, at very short notice so it could take a kind of bigger payload and he ignored all the advice of the engineers, the scientists um, and they flew it and it crashed and a lot of people died, 48 people died. Um, now if I hit this hotspot, this is a 30 second trailer for a 40 minute artwork which has got um, spatialized surround sound, which is excellent. This is a dual screen 4K projection. Um, and the, the screen size that, you're, that it's projected onto is three meters by 12 meters, it's vast. Um, so this is in a sense a poor apology for, for what it really looks like. If you want to turn your sound up a little, because this is a collaboration with two composers, Rod Rillingworth, um, and Rob Strachan, a, um, so this was authored in Unreal Engine by Sam Weil and Dave Lynch, who collaborated with me, and then uh, Roland Denning, who basically did all the archive work. So it's so, so actually really complex work and it took two and a half years to make. And it was of course made within a pandemic. And at the beginning of the pandemic, two or three of us had never met before. It was all done virtually. So I'm gonna run this short film, you ready? Are you there, Claire? Cool, okay. So that's that's an advert, really, um, and I'm, I'm and obviously I'm a bit frustrated that um, at this point I can't really. Um, it's been quite difficult to open the show. Um, 
but I've now got another two months before the show closes and I'm trying to get people to come and see it. So I'm pleased that the Makery reviews in there. And then if I just kind of, I th am I back on screen now? You are. Mike, we couldn't hear the sound. Sorry? We couldn't hear the sound on the video just there. Oh, okay, don't worry. Um, what I'll do is I'll probably, I'll send you some links and you might circulate those after the meeting. Great. So just very briefly, there's a nice book we did with Annie Bacon as the co-editor. Um, there's, you know, it's a sort of, it's a mixture of kind of cultural history, new media theory and um, sort of com community curation. Um, and I'm also really interested to, to investigate the, the relationship between airships and York, because obviously during the First World War, airship, um, airships were flying across York and involved in bombing raids on the east coast of England. Um, and also Zeppelins were present in Britain. So we think fondly of airships in our recent history, but, um, uh, airships also have much more sinister connotations for an older generation. Now I'm going to go very quickly back to my next project. And I'm going to show you just a very little bit. This is the other project. I'm, I'm not sure if you're going to get sound on this then either. Maybe I've got my settings wrong. Excuse me. Um, can we see this? No, we can't because I haven't done what I meant to do. So I'm going to do another screen share and talk a little bit about the other recent project I've been involved in, which is called Climate Emergency Services. Uh, when, you, when you share your screen, Mike, is there a, a checkbox that says share computer audio or share sound from your I'll computer? Try, I'll try and do that. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt you there. Yeah, if we, yeah, okay, thank you for that. Yeah. So yeah, we lost all the impact there of the, the trailer for um, Escaping Gravity. <laughs> okay, so this should work. So this is just a short video that Oliver Parkin made of a public artwork that I've made recently for Folkestone Triennial. And it's called Climate Emergency Services. Um, will it play? Climate Emergency Services is going to come to a place near you. We're all a bit addicted. You know, we've got a consumer culture, late capitalist, based on still digging up coal and making things out of steel. A car industry coming out of the Second World War which keeps money flowing globally. Lamborghini coming up here, bright green one. So I want this vehicle to sort of pop up in different places and just catch people out of it. Climate Emergency Services started with me wrestling with my unhealthy affection for motorised vehicles. That over the last 20, 30 years, with an ecological awareness, an increasing fear of the end of the world, that I could no longer sustain my unhealthy relationship with cars and motorbikes like I had. In, in terms of either rising water levels, the diminishment of natural fresh water, that we might need riot control vehicles to control the population when they're fighting over a bottle of water. I'd like to think that there are um, new generations of people that have got much better ideas than me. And, and hopefully there's more of them than the old world and we're going through some kind of revolution.
I'll stop that one there so we don't run out of conversation time. Um, where has that screen gone? Will that go? Yes, good. Okay. Um, so I'm also doing this project in Doncaster, Doncaster Creates. Um, and this sort of links together some of the themes that I'm exploring in a more kind of curatorial enabling way um, uh, around issues of environment, mental health, climate emergency with some of the subjects that I'm exploring as an artist. Um, some, you know, I'm trying to kind of create more alignment. And if, if you, you, can, you can see some of the projects that I've been up to here in Doncaster, most notably Art Bomb in the, the last month or so. Um, and you're all welcome to come and visit me in Doncaster when I'm down here. Um, and I reckon that will probably do on the chatting stuff. So I'm gonna come back to you there, um, pull out of sharing screen. Oh, I'm not on sharing screen anymore, am I? Now there's, there's audio, but no, not, no visuals. Can I you, think that's your audio. audio. Can you talking? Yeah. Good, okay. Um, so we're not on Sheen Square, Sheen Square, she, screen share. Um, um, maybe we can move into conversation. Okay. Okay. Okay, Mike. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, do we have, I, I'm not sure if I can see anything in the Q&A just yet. I want to um, have a chat, Claire, while people are formulating yeah, their Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I was scribbling, scribbling, scribbling. You probably saw me have so many things that I, I want to ask you about, um, but I'm not going to hog you. I. Can I ask you about, I know you're involved in, in the city of culture and, and other, you know, sort of these very large scale, long um, duration events. Mm. And from what I can tell, these seem to have, these events seem to have a much more enduring beneficial effect on the local communities than say other large events like the Commonwealth Games, for instance. Well, again. Um, and I'm just wondering how, what, what, what is it? Are there, how could you, if you had to bottle what, why that was, um, so you could put it in any, any place, any community, any neighborhood, what is it about these, these events? What makes the difference? Um, well, obviously they vary, everything's variable and nuanced and, so cit cities of culture, be they, you, I was involved in helping write the bid for the UK City of Culture poll. Um, I went as a punter to Glasgow, it smiles better in 1990. Um, I arrived into Liverpool when all the hard work had been done, the eight year process of building up the bid uh, to win the European Capital of Culture in a city where people were shocked to actually win it. Um, and then, of course, look, you know, looking at London Derry, Derry, London Derry, and Hull. I was back in Hull last week. Um, that in in terms of in, the impact studies that have been done around the the European capitals of culture, primarily by um, Beatrice Garcia, mm -hmm. um, that they are, you know, they're very different. The UK cities of culture, you know, clear. I'm slightly involved with Coventry and hoping to take climate emergency services to Coventry for the um, weekend, the opening weekend of COP26 um, and a, a forum around the Anthropocene. Um, so, re, you know, really, you know, th the two kind of polarities seem to be the bigger the amount of investment, the longer they go on for, the deeper the impact. Mm. The
Oh, Mike, I think you're frozen. You just need to unmute there, Mike. Okay. So just dropped off there. Sorry. No yeah. So you know, I think it, I think it's variable as to as the depth of impact, and of course how we measure them and how much money was spent. You know, Liverpool cost over two hundred million, maybe four hundred million if you put all the costs on top. Um, I believe whole cost approaching forty million. Mm -hmm. You know, these are big and in, big investments. Um, clearly, those are two examples which were done pre the impact of deep austerity in the pandemic. Um, can we sustain that level of investment ever again? God knows, I don't know. Um, similarly, in, in terms of the Commonwealth Games, you know, I'm not, not really in a position to comment, but I know that the research Beatrice has done also into the Olympics, um, that there may be those models becoming less relevant and that we need more ingrained, embedded, um, engagement projects um, whilst we do things which excite and inspire. Mm. I did see a question come up. They have. So let me, we've, we've got a few questions now in the Q&A. So yeah. I'm just going to run run in order. Okay. Shall, so, I, shall, I, shall I just go to them? You can. Okay. So this is in response to Tom Smith. Um, the Empathy VR project the, the reason why it was so extraordinary is it was a, a bunch of um, younger researchers who, in a way, using a, a combination of Pepper's Ghost and um, uh, VR headsets, basically managed to switch the first person um, perceptive space of the two per persons that wore the headsets. So you, you have this sensation, which is both tactile in terms of holding another hand, which was actually a virtual hand, but holding someone else's hand, which was a trick. It's actually, it was a third, third party. Um, and it could give you the, the, the actual sensation of being in someone else's body um, through trickery. And of course, uh, you know, apart from that being a trick, um, what it meant is that you could, if I do this, that if you're in a female body, if you were doing this with a, a, a female collaborator, that you could you could actually um, feel your chest, but you might have breasts. Um, similarly, people who've got physical disabilities would have the sensation of um, um, b being in a non-disabled body. Um, and that, that's really where its profoundity kind of had, had this had this impact. Um, and they did a sort of summer residency uh, in fact in Liverpool um, and it experimented with a whole range of people and our, our partners. Um, but that's probably going back maybe eight years ago. So I'm not sure where they're up to these days, but I just, lo I just loved it. It was just something I, I, I remembered as I was putting this um, presentation together. If you've got any more questions, send them back over. Um, Someone here, Isabel Jager. Oh, Isabel, hi. Um, audience inclusion in marginal groups in digital arts projects. Uh, okay, so how are there? Any, what are the particular challenges to sharing? Um, yeah. So how how do we maintain audience inclusion within digital projects? Um, again, what do we mean by inclusion? Um, for me, that the process of um, encouraging production as much as um, audience membership is really important. So, with the, I'm you know really committed to uh, finding mechanisms to enable people to become producers or have confidence in what they do as being art or creative practice. Um, and then, of course, if you then imagine Zistoff's work, which are these sort of massive public, public, pu very political public projections into public squares um, that, that in, a, in a sense, they create their own engagement through the experience of being witnessed and stimulating and provoking debate. Um, that of course, 
like the approach with the capital of culture that the, the, the pre the pre work and the work leading up to the project is probably more important than the moment that it happens um, because that that's very much about developing trusted networks and key community partnerships with diff different people who might already be doing what you think you're doing which is all new um, likewise in terms of if there is a subject or thematic that you're exploring um, who are those special interest communities or individuals that you really need on board and how you're going to get them and um, and how you're going to get them to trust you why should why should they bother you know you're going to pay them um, or is there something which is of mutual benefit in the longer term and that's you know that's something that I think everyone wrestles with and sometimes you're lucky and successful and other times it's a disaster um, um, you know a pretty chuffed at the moment that the art the art bomb festival in Doncaster which was very kind of grassroots and reminded me of going back to early days in Hull um, really did kind of um, touch a whole load of people that would not normally go anywhere near art and I'm hoping to keep some of them people on board as I develop another program for next year which is a, a Yorkshire art and ecology lab um, which is sort of building on a partnership between um, the North and Northeast Data Ecological Centre, which is actually based in York. Um, Bentley Urban Farm, which is a kind of community farm in Donny, mm -hmm. um, and a, a, a few other pr uh, partners that I'm kind of working with to do a, an open call artist residency programme leading into what might become a longer burning research slash artists art science project um, and just just chucking in the mix here that I was involved for two years on the arts at, at Kern project in Geneva with doing a residency program around the Hadron Collider so that leads me a little bit into Marion Ursa's question about how it's inspired by my dad um, so it, ironically that my dad loved his work so much that, um, that he would go to work on a weekend and in terms of fulfilling his childcare duties um, he'd take me with me when I was about 10 or 11 and let me do whatever I want in the dark room so this is the days of analog photography I'd spent the last five years taking photographs in black and white of racing cars motorbikes and cars um, and I had limitless supplies of uh, developer and uh, paper in Unilever who sponsored my early practice as a child um, whilst he got on with his research looking at spectral analysis of washing powders, um, synthetic flavours, um, he was involved in developing the freeze drying process which would lead to the frozen pea for Birdseye, a Unilever company um, and let me basically kind of um, learn how to do photography and enjoy developing photographs um what can i say which is your follow-up question however your father's work and our people to see deeper and better i believe work is driven by a similar aim thank you that's very kind of you um i think perhaps we could say something about observation I'm rubbish at drawing. I'm not your classic art student who could draw and paint. I'm not very good with, with two dimensions, but I think that at the heart of most artistic practice and science is good observation and the eye for detail and looking at the differences between one thing and another. Um, so in a sense, I share that ability with my dad. Melody Ash asks, You've touched on the climate crisis as a thematic topic for creators to explore. What opportunities do you think digital arts and immersive has in prompting behavioral change to address environmental issues? Um, this is a you know, really significant question you're asking here. Um, and I, I'll try and give some answers um, to what's effectively a multiple question. Um, that of course, you know, as part of a, a forum 
Last weekend in Folkestone, uh, part of a panel with a, um, a climate scientist who is the climate officer for Canterbury, um, with a background working with wastewater and a fairly sort of technical scientific basis, but it's now increasingly involved in a kind of advocating, um, looking at what people can do within a local authority, business and, a, a, and an individual level to change behaviour. Um, and then the other person was a, a cultural theorist who's a member of Extinction Rebellion. So we, took, we, we, we talked about what does it mean to try and uh, either make work which talks about these themes or where does activism and art making kind of come together? And this followed on the week after Extinction Rebellion making a, a significant series of action in London which are currently being hotly debated as to uh, what the impact was and what were the negative and positive elements of, of those actions. Um, similarly, I think um, we saw, you know, quite a lot of debate only in the last two days around uh, an action where there was a road closure yesterday uh, in, in, in encouraging people to think about more domestic use of energy. Um, and, and we are kind of, we're, we're at the point now, you know, like I wanted, you, you know, a lot of, I've been in conversation with people who said, how can you possibly use a diesel engine minibus, which is a hot rod, to raise a question about uh, climate emergency and um, the use of fossil fuels. Um, but for me, it was important that I've got something which I can put in front of people who are my friends, who are not environmentalists, um, not that bothered, um, and really like cars and bikes. And, you know, I live in Doncaster, which was a, you know, voted 71% to leave Europe, and I'm a Remainer. Um, and there are, you know, there's a, as you've got, you know, right through Britain, there are a whole load of people who don't think like we do. So for me, in terms of this question about how to engage with um, harder to reach audiences or people that, that um, aren't engaging at this stage, it means that we have to challenge ourselves to work in different environments and put ourselves up there to have a debate or even be disagreed with, God forbid, um, or you know, argue the toss. I think that's a responsibility. Um, I think that Alongside that, of course, that, you know, one of the comments I made last weekend was that there's a separation between making an artwork and an artist's identity with, with personal behaviour. So my personal behaviour is that I am almost vegetarian. It's my, I've been a vegetarian in the past. I'll probably return to being vegetarian before Christmas. Um, that I use a bicycle, you know, there, there are simple things that I think I have to do as a, as a kind of, as a, an ethical level in terms of my, my own behaviour. Um, but I don't think that should stop us doing things which hit a bigger agenda and get press and marketing. I think it's really important um, that we um, are prepared to take risks and put ourselves out there in public space. Um, Otherwise, the, the bubbles get tighter and the, the, there's no osmosis between um, different communities. And I think there really, really needs to be. Um, of course, as the reality, you know, it's like in South Yorkshire and in North Yorkshire, but in South Yorkshire specifically, I was involved in um, fundraising for the South Yorkshire Flood Disaster Fund two years ago. Um, the images that you see on the side of climate emergencies van um, is a mixture of um, valorizing hot rod culture through 70s style flame job, but that is overlaid with actual images of forest fires in New South Wales. Um, and with a brother in New South Wales and witnessing um, forest fires uh, 15 years ago in uh, country Victoria where a number of people died um, that you, you, you know clearly the sort of malaise of awareness you know um, amongst less aware communities is shifting um, people 
will increasingly feel. And as that, as the, as the crisis gets closer to home, the innovation has to accelerate. Um, the issue that we've really got is that unfortunately, as individuals, artists, researchers, we may have a strong sense of personal responsibility and interest, but at a government level, the amount of spend on policies that are changing behaviours at the government political level and policy making is a pittance. It's something, you know, it's like, it's, it's something like 6% six, six on policy change expenditure is going towards environmental um, improvement. And the rest of it is actually going on policies which um, actually accelerate our disaster. So, so politically, we need to be more involved. Um, Sarah Smith, one of my partners in Doncaster, has just become a councillor. Um, and, you know, that, that, that's quite a scary thing for me to consider. To, to, but ultimately, we've, we, we need to be talking to different communities and trying harder. Um, OK, I'll shut up talking. I'm going to just, um, if, I, if I may, Mike, just um, follow that up with perhaps one last question or one or two last questions. Sure. Because it made me think when you were talking there, um, inevitably when, when you're reaching out to different communities or you're bringing different people together, whether that's a scientist and an artist in a, a workshop or you know whether it, it's entire communities, um, there's gonna be conflict. And I just wondered, in your experience, what you thought about how do you conflict can 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 also bring with it though a lot of high energy. How can you use that energy? How can you turn that conflict so that it's constructive and not not destructive okay. to, the, to the goal? I might start off by saying that that if, if the starting point is to expect conflict, you'll get it. Um, and and in a, in a way, I think that I'm you know as um. If, if I look back at my past, I think I'm probably someone who was attracted to conflict, but as I got older, I've softened. Um, I think that in terms of any kind of appreciative inquiry, we're, we're looking to draw upon the, the, the commonalities rather than differences. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if people have done their research and are confident in their position, even if it may be different from other people's, it makes it easy for other people to disagree. Um, and that healthy disagreement and comparison of ideas, ideology, theory, um, leads to new knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. When people of radically different disciplines uh, brought together, say in a lab between a nuclear physicist or a particle physicist um, and a, an artist. And I can think of you know, a whole variety of examples of where I've been involved in uh, putting labs like that together. Um, again, taking time for people to socialize, mm -hmm. taking time for people to, to really show their work and, uh, and letting people understand what's driving them or what are the touch points. Uh, one of my favorite projects of all time is the um, Unfold project with Ryochi Kurokawa, who's a Japanese artist based in Berlin, who um, collaborated with CEA, which is an astronomical data center in France. And we commissioned a piece of work with him in Liverpool. And then I, I kind of toured that to Korea and China um, and then showed it it was included in the exhibition I curated at the York Art Gallery called Strata, which I meant to mention earlier. So, so if you saw Strata, Strata Rock Dust Stars at the Museum and Art Gallery in York about 2018, that incorporated a very small version of Ryochi Kurokawa's piece. Um, and, and again, that's, you know, I think it's also about personalities and time and chemistry, you know, I think it's, you know, so there's an element of chance in there, but how can you optimize chance um, by, you know, you know, I play a bit of tennis, you know, I'm a sort of rubbish born again tennis player. And what I learned through tennis is that it's, 
the sooner that you can see what's about to happen and that you've visualized it and imagine what the what what the shot might be the better your chances are of, of kind of um returning the ball better mm. um, and so similarly if, if you're putting a team to, of people together it's actually taking the time to really think about who those people are and 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 what their motivations are and what they're going to want out of spending that time together um you know we're all over productized and far too busy you know we, we you know we we're really rubbish at managing our own time um so so in one sense you're trying to create open trying to create open space to let people experiment talk about anything um but at the same time as that you know that people are very focused in their own research and um need to see the benefits at some point or other as to why they're doing something mm. does that help at all absolutely it's very I, I agree with everything it's the investment isn't it and and the patience behind it all as well um and 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 trying to marry that with very you know funding or or the demands on the time and money as well so I'm just going to ask you one one final question. You know, I'm just going to give you a, a quick and easy question at the end. It's not going to be, of course not. Um, but we're in times of, of a lot of uncertainty, and as you mentioned, we don't know what what um, money is going to be available, what what priorities are going to be around. But what are your hopes for the next five to ten years with your own work and the work that you want to see come to fruition? Um, I suppose, you know, as, as I say, kind of the way that I'm beginning to marry um, my, my practice as a curator or an enabler with my own art practice, um, you know, get, get, it, it gets easier, perhaps. So in terms that I feel very fortunate that I can pretty much go into different environments and talk to people on any kind of level. Um, and of course I'm speaking as a white male. Mm -hmm. um, I think that using those skills to enable other people to do the, the, to do the work and take the ownership of the project becomes increasingly important for me. So Art Bomb is not me curating a festival, it's been me putting quite a lot of energy into developing a platform for other people to practice making a festival. Mm -hmm. And in that process, um, skills development takes place to the point where I hope that uh, next, next year I take more of a backseat. Um, as an artist, that there's some of the central themes that are coming out of the research um, and are sort of st stimulated by making the reactions to this work get carried forward um i don't know what the new work might be i haven't got a clue i might basically been too busy to have the free space to, to to imagine what a new artwork might look like but i can imagine what a process might look like um alongside that i want to see as escaping gravity get shown elsewhere mm -hmm. so the friedrich Schaff and zeppelin museum in germany is somewhere i'd love it to come to um, great if it came to York, so I'm trying to have a dialogue with, with the art gallery. Um, climate emergency services, having, it's been on, on, the, on, on show in Folkestone and driven around Folkestone, but um, I've got plans to get it out on the road a bit. And, and in that process, I might make a road movie with different people and how they respond to it as they try and work out what it is and what questions it's asking. So seeing it as a bit of a utility to, to, to further conversation. Um, yeah, and, um, and, and overall to just be able to continue to do something. Great. Well, thank you, Mike. That, that brings us to a, a great place to stop. And I just want to thank you again for your time today and, and coming to speak to us all. Um, you will, I'm clapping. You have to imagine everybody is Thanks. clapping. Okay. Um, Thank you, everybody. And at some point, I hope to meet you in person in a room. I much prefer it. OK.
Okay. But we get we're getting closer and closer. Yeah, I'm just seeing some nice things in the chat. So thank you for that. Yeah. All right mm -hmm. then. Yep. Oh, the other the other thing I just wanted to mention briefly is I'm also involved as a um, artist mentor to a project called City to City, which is a UNESCO project, and um, York Media Art Guild is a um, member of that. So there is a um, there is a, a York artist involved in this network of 14 cities, which includes China, South Korea, Japan, Germany, France. Um, you know, there's a, there is a list, and I, maybe I'll show share the, the the link to City to City, because that mm. will be an ongoing project for York, um, and we'd like more people to know about it actually in York, because there may be another open call to apply for next year. Brilliant. Great. All right. We'll make sure okay. that that's shared out, Mike. Jolly good. Nice Brilliant. one. I'm off. Talk to you again soon. Push me off. <laughs> Two o'clock. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks. Bye.